Hello, welcome to today's workshop. There has been no period in time in which the mission of the Small Business Administration has been more important for you. We are here to aid, counsel, assist, and protect the interest of small business concerns, to preserve free competitive enterprise, and to maintain and strengthen the overall economy of our nation. The SBA is the only cabinet level federal agency fully dedicated to small business. As such, we are your only go-to resource for counseling, capital, and contracting expertise, as well as being the voice for small businesses. I'm Dr. Donna Peebles. I'm the Associate Administrator for the Office of Business Development. Today, our team is excited to share with you information on one of our most dynamic small business programs, the 8A Business Development Program. Today's workshop is one in a series of trainings by our SBA team to better equip small businesses nationwide with tools for building their businesses and enhancing their market success. Most small business owners have heard of the 8A program. Many ask, what are the requirements of the program and how do I apply? In today's workshop, we're gonna share this information and more with you. And afterwards, we'll be available to answer all the questions that you might have. This information is extremely important to you because as a business owner, you will want to know before you apply to the 8A program, if you meet the basic requirements of eligibility, and just as important, how best to demonstrate your eligibility to SBA. Before getting started, I wanted to share with you a few things to think about. One of the 8A program regulations often overlooked by firms applying is the one-time eligibility requirement. Per this requirement, a firm or the individual upon whom eligibility is based may participate in the 8A program only one time. There are no exceptions to this once in a lifetime rule. And it's important that you understand the significance of this regulation as it relates to your business. The magnitude of the benefits to be gained or lost when using your one-time eligibility will be determined by when you decide to use it. If you and your firm, in fact, do meet the program's eligibility requirements, you must ask yourself, is this the most strategic time to apply based on your firm's readiness? Is the 8A program the right program for you and your business at this time? You may be eligible, but are you ready? This could be one of the most important business decisions you make, and consequently, it deserves more thought than many applicants give it. In closing, please remember, I am invested in your success. Our team is invested in providing you the technical assistance you need to grow your business. We carry a passion for our program with an attitude of service to help you. Thanks so much for your interest in the 8A program and enjoy today's workshop. You've just made a really good investment in your business. Enjoy the workshop. Today, we'll be covering the ins and outs of the 8A Business Development Program. My name is Cynthia Almondares, and I'll be presenting with Mr. Otis Turner. We are both business opportunity specialists in SBA's Office of Certification and Eligibility in San Francisco. And our office works with small businesses that are applying for the 8A Business Development Program. Our objectives today are to answer your questions regarding the 8A Business Development Program. What is the 8A Business Development Program? Am I eligible and ready for the 8A Business Development Program? And how can I submit a successful 8A application? To give you some background on federal contracting, the federal government purchases trillions of dollars in goods and services every year. In purchasing those goods and services, federal government wants to award contracting dollars to small businesses, and the goal for small businesses is 23%. The goal for women-owned small businesses is 5%. The goal for small disadvantaged businesses, which includes 8A certified companies, is 5%. For hub zone companies, the goal is 3%. And for service disabled veteran owned small businesses, the goal is 3%. In light of these goals, 
federal agencies want to work with 8A certified companies. So the goals of the 8A Business Development Program are to assist small businesses owned and controlled by socially and economically disadvantaged individuals compete in the federal marketplace. The 8A program is a nine-year business development program. And during those nine years, SBA wants to help companies build capacity, grow, and gain a foothold in federal contracting. And SBA does this through providing business development support. As far as the business development assistance is available to 8A program participants, the first thing that firms will receive is an 8A orientation. At the 8A orientation, firms will be meeting with their assigned business opportunity specialist from the local servicing office, and that specialist will stay with them throughout their nine years in the program. SBA also offers referrals to its resource partners, as well as training through the 7J training program. Another aspect of 8A business development assistance is contracting. SBA will offer marketing assistance, including invitations to 8A business development events. And finally, SBA will offer assistance in other areas, such as financing and surety bonds. In light of the benefits of the 8A program, you want to consider whether the program is right for you, and you want to know what to expect out of the 8A program. First and foremost, 8A program is a business development program. One of the most common misconceptions about the program is, you know, once you're certified, federal agencies will start calling you and start giving you contracts. Uh, that is not the case. Uh, in fact, there's no guarantee of federal contracts or 8A contracts. Any contracts that you get out of the program are as a result of aggressive self-marketing. You still have to market your company and get agencies interested in your firm's products or services. You want to keep in mind that the 8A program is not suited for all companies, so you need to consider whether it's the right program for you. It is a one-time nine-year program term, so you want to be able to take advantage of your nine years. Now that you know what the 8A program is, let's talk about the eligibility criteria. There are seven basic criteria, social disadvantage, economic disadvantage, size, ownership, control, potential for success, and character. Let's talk about social disadvantage. SBA has determined that there are certain groups of individuals that are presumed to be socially disadvantaged, meaning if you're a member of one of these groups, you don't have to provide additional information to prove that you're socially disadvantaged. These groups include Black Americans, Asian Pacific Americans, Hispanic Americans, Native Americans, and subcontinent Asian Americans. Now, if you're not a member of one of these groups, that doesn't mean that you cannot apply for the 8A program. You can apply, but what you will have to do is establish your case of social disadvantage based on a preponderance of the evidence. A preponderance of the evidence is a standard where you have to show that more likely than not, what you've asserted is what happened. One of the first things you have to do to establish your case of social disadvantage based on a preponderance of the evidence is to identify one objective distinguishing feature that has led to your social disadvantage. It could be your race, gender, ethnicity, physical disability, etc. Next, you'll have to provide a narrative with specific personal examples of instances where you've experienced social disadvantage. Your social disadvantage must be chronic and substantial. It must have been personally suffered in the United States, and it must have had a negative impact on your entry and or advancement in the business world. Let's move on to economic disadvantage. There's three areas that we look at to determine whether someone is economically disadvantaged. There's personal net worth, personal income, and personal assets. With respect to personal net worth, your personal net worth has to be less than 750,000. That's after we exclude 
the equity in your primary residence, the equity in the company that's applying for the program, and all IRA and retirement accounts. With respect to your personal income, your three-year average income must be $350,000 or less. And with respect to your personal assets, the fair market value of all your personal assets must be $6 million or less. The only exclusions when we're looking at assets would be your IRA and retirement accounts. There's no other exclusions. So you have to meet all three of these thresholds to be considered economically disadvantaged. Size. Your company does have to be a small business in order to qualify for the program. And there are size standards that are associated with different industries. And the size standard that's applicable to your company is the one that's for its primary NAICS code. NAICS is the North American Industry Classification System Code. Your primary NAICS code should be based on your largest source of revenues for the most recently completed fiscal year. Okay, and once you figure out what your primary NAICS code is, you can look up the size standard. And size standards are based on average annual receipts or average number of employees during the past 12 months. Average annual receipts is calculated by taking your total receipts over the past three fiscal years and dividing by three. Ownership. In order to qualify for the 8A program, your company has to be at least 51% unconditionally and directly owned by one or more disadvantaged individuals. Now, the way we determine ownership is we'll be looking at your federal business tax returns and we'll be looking at your business legal documents. For example, if you're a partnership, we'll be looking at the partnership agreement. If you're a limited liability company, we'll be looking at the operating agreement. If you're a corporation, we'll be looking at the stock certificates and the stock register. Control and management. The company has to be controlled and managed by one or more disadvantaged individuals. Specifically, the disadvantaged individual must control all business decisions. This means that they have control over all decisions pertaining to the company. There's no restrictions on what actions he or she can take. In addition, the disadvantaged individual must hold the highest position in the company. In a corporation, the highest position would be CEO or president. In a partnership, the highest position would be managing partner. In an LLC, the highest position would be managing member. The disadvantaged individual must also be the highest compensated individual in the company, unless he or she can show that the lower compensation is helping the company. And finally, the disadvantaged individual who holds the highest position must devote full time to the company. Full time is generally regarded as 40 or more hours per week. If the disadvantaged individual has any outside employment or outside business interests, SBA will ask for additional information, including the number of hours per week and official work schedule. And we will look at that information to determine whether or not the individual is devoting full time to the company that's applying for the program, or whether that outside employment or outside business interest interferes with his or her ability to manage the company that's applying for the program. Let's move on to potential for success. SB wants to ensure that companies that are approved for the program have the potential to succeed in the program. So one of the first things that we look at is what we call the two-year rule. The two-year rule states that you must have two most recent years of federal business tax returns that show revenue generation in the primary NAICS code. Okay, this means, for example, if you're applying now, uh, your company would have to have 2019 and 2018 federal business tax returns. They would have to show revenue generation, and those revenues have to be in the primary industry in which you're seeking certification. Now, if you don't meet the two-year rule, uh, there is a waiver. Uh, I will talk about the waiver in the next slide. It is more difficult to gain entry under the waiver. Okay, But the reason we have this two-year rule is the 8 program is not really geared towards 
startups or relatively young companies. It's for companies that have been around for a while and they've already built some experience and they now want to expand into being a prime contractor for the federal government. In addition to the two-year rule, uh, we also look at your company's financial capacity. We're looking at your company's revenue generation, profitability, net worth position, working capital position, and sources of capital. I'm sure the question is, are we looking for specific numbers? Uh, we don't have specific numbers that we're looking for. However, we're looking at your company's overall financial condition and whether or not it has the ability to perform on contracts of the size and scope of those in the 80 program. We also look at managerial and technical experience under potential for success, looking at the prior work experience of the disadvantaged individuals. Uh, we also look at licensing. If your company is operating in an industry that requires licensing, it should hold that license. For example, if you're doing contracting, uh, most states require you to hold a contractor's license. And finally, we look at your company's record of performance. Has your company previously completed work in its primary industry? Now let's talk about the waiver. As I mentioned earlier, if, you do, if your firm does not meet the two-year rule, it can request a waiver of the two-year rule. Okay. You'll note there, it says that if the company has not yet generated revenues, it cannot waive the two-year rule. Okay, again, the company has not generated revenues, it cannot waive the two-year rule. Now for the waiver, there's five waiver conditions and your company must meet all five conditions to be granted a waiver. First waiver condition is the disadvantaged individual or individuals must have substantial and demonstrated business management experience. The second waiver condition is the company must have demonstrated technical experience, including possessing necessary licensing permits, etc. The third waiver condition is the company must have adequate capital to sustain and carry out its operations. The fourth waiver condition, and this is the condition that's most difficult for relatively young companies to meet. It states that the company must have successful past performance in the primary industry. This waiver condition has to be met by the company that's applying for the program. It cannot be based on the personal work experience of the owners, um, or other companies that those owners may have operated. The company applying for the program must have actually completed some work in order to meet this waiver condition. The fifth waiver condition is the company must have or demonstrate the ability to timely obtain the necessary resources such as equipment, business facilities, personnel, et cetera, that would be needed to perform on contracts. And again, your company has to meet all five of these conditions to be granted a waiver of the two-year rule. And if your company has not generated revenue, it cannot waive the two-year rule. Character. The company and its principles must have good character. Now, we've listed some of the items that show a lack of good character. That can include adverse information regarding criminal conduct, debarred or suspended individuals or companies. Um, if you're currently debarred or suspended from receiving assistance from the federal government, you would not meet the good character criterion. Lack of business integrity, um, as shown by guilty pleas, convictions, or civil judgments, that could affect your ability to meet the good character requirement. Any principal who is incarcerated or on parole or on probation. Uh, that could affect your ability to meet the good character criterion. And knowingly submitting false information during the application process. When you submit your application, you are certified that you're providing true and correct information. So if SBA finds that you've provided uh, false information and you knowingly did that, then you would not meet the good character requirement. Now let's talk about some issues that would cause your company to be ineligible for the 8A program. Federal obligations. If the company or any of its principals fail to pay financial obligations to the federal government, then the company would not be eligible for the program. 
Federal obligations can include past due taxes to the IRS, unresolved tax liens, and delinquent or defaulted federal loans and SBA loans. If you have any of those types of obligations and you fail to pay them, we suggest that at minimum, you establish a repayment plan or an installment agreement and start making payments so that you can show that you're current on your federal debt. Some of the other ineligible businesses include brokers, debarred or suspended individuals, and nonprofit organizations. And finally, the 8A program has a one-time use of eligibility restriction, and it's one time for the company as well as for the individuals who claim disadvantage status to qualify that company. So as I mentioned earlier, the 8A program is a nine-year business development program. Okay, once a company is approved, it's deemed to have used its eligibility. It cannot reapply again in the future for the 8A program. And for those individuals that claim disadvantaged status to qualify that company, once the company is approved, those individuals are deemed to have used their eligibility. They cannot claim disadvantage again in the future. Now, that's not to say that they cannot be involved in another company that wants to apply for the 8A program in the future. They can certainly be involved in that company. However, they cannot claim disadvantaged status again. So in light of the one-time use of eligibility restriction, you need to ask yourself when you should apply for that program and are you ready for the 8A program? It is a nine-year program and since it is a limited time, you wanna ensure that you take full advantage of your nine years and increase your chance of winning 8A contracts. One of the common things that we hear when we talk to companies that have previously participated in the program is, uh, I wish I'd done more research, or I wish I had waited um, until a later date to apply. The reason for that is some companies find that they are too small to actually pursue uh, federal prime contracts. Uh, other companies find that they don't have the necessary experience. If uh, a company's never done any type of public contracting, whether it's a local or a state or federal level, they find the federal contracting procedures you know, overwhelming. So you really need to ask yourself whether or not it's the right time for you to apply. And I wanna emphasize that you can meet all of the eligibility requirements and be eligible but maybe you're not ready to apply for the 8A program. So you wanna ask yourself some questions. Do you have the capacity to deliver on federal contracts? Do you have sufficient cash flow to perform on federal contracts? Do you have the demonstrated capability and past performance? And finally, are you open to advice on growing your business? It's important to ask yourself these questions and be honest. As, as I said, you can be eligible, but the question is, are you ready to apply for the 8A program? Now, once you ask yourself these questions, if you find that you are ready for the 8A program, uh, I hope that everyone decides to apply when it's the right time. And now that I've talked about the eligibility criteria and readiness for the program, I'm going to pass it over to Otis Turner, who will give you more information about the application processing, as well as uh, give you tips on how to submit a successful application. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Otis Turner. I am a business opportunity specialist in the Office of Certification Eligibility in San Francisco. Today, I'm going to discuss with you the 8A Business Development Electronic Application Process in CertifySBA.gov. There are two primary issues with applications we receive. The first is, the firm or the applicant, or both, do not meet the eligibility requirements. The next major issue is the submission of incomplete applications. Although sometimes possible, it is rare that lack of eligibility can be remedied. However, that is not the case with incomplete applications. Today, we are going to focus on incomplete applications. 
I will cover some of the do's and don'ts of the process, highlight a few common errors, and provide a few tips. My primary focus will be on the do's so that the don'ts become self-evident. The application process is completely electronic. All applications received by SBA are reviewed. During the last fiscal year, approximately 5,500 applications were received and reviewed. When we say that the agency will review, receive, and evaluate all applications, this does not mean that all applications received will be processed. In fact, incomplete applications will not be processed. As indicated on this slide, there are actually three phases of processing, pre-screening, screening, and processing. During pre-screening and screening, SBA gives applicants every opportunity available to submit a complete application. Once the application has been determined to be sufficiently complete for determination, it is accepted for processing. The timing for the agency to render a determination of eligibility of a complete application is within 90 days from the acceptance of the application as being complete. The 90-day clock begins on day one of the third phase, processing. This brings us to the first tip of the day, which is at the bottom of the screen. Submit a complete application. To help you better understand the dynamics of the 8 ABD application process in terms of time, let's take a look at this slide depicting a conveyor belt. Imagine that each canister represents an 8A application. In this diagram, time goes from left to right. That is to say, the application on the far right of your screen was the first to be received by SBA. The one on the far left was the most recent to be received. I'm going to address the green application, which is second from the right on your screen. Following the principle of first in, first out, at this point in time, there is only one application ahead of the green application, and there are three applications behind it. However, the green application has been found to be incomplete. Therefore, it must be returned to the applicant for completion. The applications behind the green applicant, that is, the purple, orange, and teal applications, have now moved ahead. Assuming those applications have been found to be complete and that it was not necessary to return them for more information, the green application has lost its place in line and added time to its review. We have all heard horror stories of applications taking an extraordinary length of time for processing. Let's look at the green application once again. This time envision that SBA has had to return it not just once, but twice or even three times in an effort to give the applicant every opportunity possible to submit a complete application. Also envision that during this time, the application on the far right represented in turquoise, has been moving forward the entire time. I believe you can imagine the significant difference in processing time between the two applications amidst the total pipeline of over 5,000 applications. The application is the vehicle by which an applicant may demonstrate eligibility for the 8ABD program. When considering submission of an 8A application, it is important to understand that the burden of proof to demonstrate eligibility is on the applicant concern. If a concern does not provide requested information within the allotted time provided by SBA, or if it submits incomplete information, SBA may presume that disclosure of the missing information would adversely affect the firm or would demonstrate lack of eligibility in the area to which the information relates. Now you may ask, what is the allotted time provided by SBA? SBA will advise a program applicant within 15 days after the receipt of an application whether the application is complete, and if not, what additional information or clarification is required to complete the application. If the application is in the first phase, pre-screening, there is no current time frame for responding. If your application is in the second phase, that is screening, and the information required to complete it is judged to be minimal, you will have 15 days within which to respond. 
If at that time there remains a significant amount of information required even after pre-screening, the application may be returned and at some point closed out. You should note that SBA in its sole discretion may request information or clarification of information contained in the application at any time in the application process. This means that even though an application may have already been accepted as being complete, you may receive further requests for information or other documentation. Let me put some context on the application process. The application is organized to collect a large amount of data to efficiently address all issues of program eligibility. Each data point addresses an issue of eligibility. One should follow the application prompts in organizing and uploading information, not simply aggregate documents and upload them randomly. Be sure to review your application to ensure that you have answered every question and uploaded every document requested. Also, make sure you have not uploaded documents which SBA did not request. There is an application checklist in the training section of the application which identifies documents you will need. This will be of tremendous assistance to you. Now ask yourself the following questions. Have I answered every question asked? And please note that not applicable, i.e. NA, is not an answer to a yes or no question. Have I provided every document requested? Or have I explained why I did not provide a document requested? Have I anticipated potential issues or questions raised by my answers or documents which will need clarification? And finally, is my application well organized? Now I'd like to speak about naming documents. How you name a file is critical to the time it takes to review your application. It is strongly recommended that you follow the naming convention file underscore year, for example, personal tax return underscore 2020, or business tax return underscore 2020. Anything else is incorrect. Anything else adds to the time it takes for the analyst reviewing your application to do so. Double check your upload to ensure that the file name you indicated you uploaded is in fact the file which was uploaded. This is another way of checking that you have provided all documents requested and it saves precious time of the individual reviewing your application. Anticipating issues is important in submitting an 8A application. I stated earlier that NA is not an acceptable answer to a question, and this is true. However, there may be instances where a yes or no requires some qualification or additional information. Therefore, I would ask you, have you anticipated potential issues or questions raised by your answers or documents which need clarification? Examples of issues which are often problematic are full-time devotion, major volatility in your firm's revenues and or profitability, poorly documented changes in ownership and or changes of ownership where no consideration was paid. Anticipate that we are going to ask you about any aspect of your business which is not self-explanatory or self-evident, so take control of the process and explain it in advance. Errors add to the time required to review and process an application. The most common errors result from the failure of an applicant to read and follow an instruction. Let's look at several common errors which add time to the review of an application. The disadvantaged individual section of the application is where the eligibility requirements of social and economic disadvantage status are addressed. To this end, SBA requires that an applicant provide a complete copy of his or her personal federal tax returns, including all schedules and forms for the most recent three years. There are multiple common infractions committed here. A few examples include, the applicant uploads only two years of personal tax returns, not three years as requested. The applicant does not upload the personal tax return for the most recent year, or a copy of the request for an extension. 
the applicant uploads copies of the personal state tax returns. Key here is that SBA requests only the federal return. As a matter of practice, we review every document submitted by an applicant. Even though we didn't request it, if you provide a copy of your state tax return, we will review it just in case it proves to contain relevant information. Generally, it does not, and therefore, this time becomes wasted time. The applicant does not upload copies of all schedules and forms, most frequently W-2s. If the return reported wages, without the W-2s, we are not able to calculate an applicant's average gross income for the past three years. Any one of these errors adds needless time to the processing of an application. When compounded by multiple errors, it goes without saying that the delay is increased exponentially. Here are some helpful tips. Minimize the time required to review your application by answering all questions asked. As I indicated earlier, every question asked provides a data point which contributes to a determination of program eligibility. When you fail to answer a question, the analyst has only two choices. He or she can come back to you for the answer. This, of course, adds time to the review of your application. Or two, the analyst can render a determination of eligibility without the information. If it is the latter option, this may work against you and result in the application being declined. So why take that risk? Provide all documents or information requested. Take, for example, the completion of personal financial information. I would say that 90% of applicants provide the details of their major assets when prompted. Real estate, retirement accounts, bank accounts. But when asked to provide a value of their personal property, there is no response or they simply indicate zero. Personal property includes such things as jewelry, art and other household furnishings, boats, and so forth. It is simply not credible that an applicant has no personal property. I believe the simplest way to view this is to consider your response to a request for proposal or request for bid. You know from experience that if you leave out any single element of that request, your response is immediately discarded as non-responsive. Anticipate issues which need further clarification. Examples of such issues are infinite, so I will give two examples. Ownership of a firm is of supreme importance for 8A certification. So if there have been any changes in the ownership of the company, even if more than two years previously, provide the details of the changes in anticipation of questions from the analyst. Another critical element of 8A eligibility is that the owners be socially disadvantaged. So if, for example, you are claiming to be socially disadvantaged based on your Hispanic American heritage, but your name is Sean Fremont or Nancy Jordan, recognize that these are not traditional Hispanic names and that there will be questions about your Hispanic American heritage. Do not provide information which is not requested or does not provide clarification of an issue of eligibility. For example, copies of your WOSBY or HUBZONE certification, community awards, letters of reference. The application requests the documents SBA views as relevant to 8A eligibility. The application document list is a perfect guide for what you should upload. Any document which is not on that list is probably of no value to 8A certification unless it is to address one of those issues which need further clarification. For example, an explanation of why your business tax returns do not reflect the NICE code which you are applying for certification for. Give document files accurate but common sense names. Better yet, follow the naming instruction provided in the training section of the application. For example, personal taxes underscore 2018. Next to answering every question asked and uploading every document requested, this is the most important tip I can give you. Failure to follow the naming instruction is also probably the most common problem with applications. 
When you do not follow the naming instruction we have provided, you increase the time required to review your application. The correct naming of a file, in addition to the correct placement of the file where requested, is significant in facilitating the expeditious review of your application. Review every document you upload to ensure the document in the file is the document you intended to upload. It is not uncommon that an applicant uploads the wrong file. For example, the application requires applicants to upload three years of personal federal tax returns, including all schedules and forms. In error, the applicant names the files correctly but uploads, uploads only a copy of the same year twice. A simple review of the file name and the document would avoid this. When you respond to a request for additional information, do not haphazardly upload documents. Provide a cover letter or transmittal memo explaining your response. The majority of applications submitted are incomplete for many of the reasons already discussed. Therefore, they require additional information. SBA will send a very detailed letter requesting the applicant provide answers to questions not answered, upload documents not provided, or a combination of the both. Resubmitting the application with a cover letter or transmittal memo explaining your responses is a tool for the analyst in reviewing your response. This allows for efficiency in a review of your response. Remember, analysts are reviewing multiple applications concurrently. So before you submit your application, review the application checklist and also review all uploaded files to ensure they are not password protected, are not upside down, and are legible. These last two points address quality control. Think of it this way. Your application as a product of your company is a representation of the quality of your company's product or service. If your application is riddled with errors and omissions, what does this say about your company's product or service? The 8A certification process is a very complex process, as is government contracting. There are many opportunities for errors and mistakes. Some errors or mistakes are more serious than others. All have the potential to negatively impact on the processing of your application ranging from more time to review the application to a negative decision of eligibility. So take the time to review your application to make sure that you have done everything possible to convey your eligibility as a viable supplier to the federal government. Thank you for your interest in the 8A Business De Development Program and your participation in today's workshop. And all the best of fortune in your business.